Hey, welcome to Head First Fishing. Appreciate you coming by the channel today. Hey, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You'll be following all the really cool fishing videos that we got coming down the line. Everything from action fishing to tutorials to special guests. Hey, we got today Captain Dylan Hubbard of Hubbard's Marina in Madeira Beach, Florida. These guys have been at it for a long time. Dylan, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you and what you do. Well, I'm Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina. I'm a fourth generation Floridian angler. Uh, Hubbard's Marina started back in 1928 when my great grandfather started with rowboats and cane poles. Uh, nowadays, we do everything from two inches of water back in the back country, out past a thousand foot, doing that deep drop in with electric reels. Basically, anything you want to catch, if it swims in the Gulf, we have a trip to go get it. Any size group, whether you've got one person or you've got 120, uh, we can do it. And also, we have really specialized vessels, like our 60-foot Hatteras, which is more of a luxury-style vessel. And then we have our uh, Flying Hub 2, which is the first of its kind in the entire nation. A U.S. Coast Guard inspected hydrofoil assisted catamaran. Mm -hmm. It's able to get a group of 14 guys out past uh, that 70 to 80, 100 mile mark in a matter of two or three hours. It runs at about 45 miles an hour and it's super smooth, super fast, and super quiet. It's like the special ops of fishing boats. Like, no <laughs> exaggeration. I know people throw the term around a lot because everybody likes it, but this boat is really super cool. It's like, okay, you want to be you know, hauling in big grouper here in a, you know, an hour, let's go. Yeah, you can, do a deep, you, you can do a deep drop trip in uh, 15 hours time and you're able to get out there to six, 700 foot of water in just three hours. So yeah. it's a really unique option. That along with the Flying Hub 1 and the Hub, we have a lot of different unique charter options here at Hubbard's Marina and big group charters are some of our specialties. But today we're gonna talk a little bit more about what's going on. Uh, we're here in the month of April, spring fishing in full swing, getting ready to come up on uh, the summertime fishing where the red grouper start really getting excited. You've got the snapper species coming into play. Big mangoes, I love them. Yes, and red snappers right around the corner. Uh, we have king of the beach coming up, so kingfish are out in full mm -hmm. swing. Lots of tournaments going on. Uh, but first I'd like to start out with a little bit of red grouper action. Uh, red grouper right now, uh, because of our mild winter, we've had kind of a unique season on red grouper. Uh, they haven't really come into play like they normally do. In the winter time, a lot of times they're spawning out in that deeper water. That's why we have our deep water closure of red grouper. Mm -hmm. um, but this year, it seems like they're still kind of confused as to what time of year it is. They're still kind of spread out. But we are finding them out over that flat area of hard rock bottom in the deeper water. Mm -hmm. Right now, anywhere from about 180 to about 90 foot of water, you can find some keeper red grouper. And my favorite way to target them is drifting over hard areas of rock bottom. That flat, hard rock bottom, the Swiss cheese bottom, right. those limestone cracks, that's mm -hmm. where you're going to find a large concentration of those red groupers. Among other things. Uh, always among yeah. other things. Right. Uh, this time of year, it always pays off to have that flat line out, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Sure. Uh, red grouper, I love uh, drifting with a long strip of uh, dead squid. You can get those squid wings and strip them up. And uh, a long strip of squid, anywhere from 6 to 12 inches, gives you a nice uh, octopus tentacle mimic bait that really gets those red groupers excited. Uh, anywhere from about a half inch to a quarter inch thickness and again about 8 to 10, 8 to 12 inches and uh, when you get a few of those drifting over a hard area of rock bottom that red grouper looking up thinks it's a big school of octopus moving through and they just can't help but come out of their holes get excited and start chewing for you. Definitely yeah they those fish they live in areas that provide a couple of different things they provide homes, shelter, mm -hmm. ambush points uh, and those hard, flat, rocky bottoms, and there could be rock piles too, but these areas uh, that lie underneath the sand and sometimes come above the sand, that's what enables the ecosystem out there to grow and the yeah. food chain starts. And so when you have these areas, that's where the marine plants start to grow. And when you have the plants start growing, that's where the little small fish start to hide yep. and eat and stuff like that. And the food chain just builds from there. Yeah, red grouper are a scavenger species. Uh, gag grouper, they'll make a home in a little hole or under a ledge, and they'll stay there for three or four weeks. Black grouper, they'll stay there for six, eight months. Whereas red grouper are constantly moving. At night, red grouper go out over sand 
or shell bottom to scavenge live shrimp and other different species like live squid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then during the day, they're over those flat, hard rock bottom areas or sitting in the bottom of that Swiss cheese or in the bottom of that crack, right. waiting for some of those uh, prey items to come over and ambush. So and that's why drifting allows you to cover more area, show your baits to more fish and generally be more successful. Sure. And for some of you that don't know, when he's talking about about Swiss cheese bottom, that's a bottom that is very, it's like potholes in the highway, mm -hmm. basically. It's very pocketed and provides a lot of cover for those fish species out there. Yep, and a lot of times you're going to have sea fans and uh, other marine algae, like he was talking about, and that provides cover for those uh, shrimp and other smaller species that are going to get those red grouper into the area. Uh, as far as red grouper tackle, I like a medium gear ratio. Uh, something that's going to give you enough power to reel that fish in, uh, but something that's not going to be too fast where you don't have the power. Because the higher the gear ratio, the lower the power. Exactly. And the lower the gear ratio, the more power you have. Right. For red grouper, you kind of want to find that happy medium. I like a three to one or a four to one. And using something like a two speed reel gives you the ability to have two reels in one. Uh, because you can be fishing that hard rock bottom uh, for some of those mangrove snapper or some of those quicker biting species and then if you do get that red grouper and you're lucky enough you can hit a button drop it in a low gear and kind of downshift and uh, get that red grouper up off the bottom so a two-speed reel to me is invaluable and it really works well for uh, targeting those red grouper because so often there's going to be other species mixed in on that swiss cheese bottom mm -hmm. um, the flat hard bottom is definitely the trick, but you can find them over that shell bottom too, especially coming into summertime. Mm -hmm. Red grouper are going to be over those bait shows. So often people will fly by a bait show over uh, shell bottom or semi hard bottom and not think anything of it. Right. Well, come summertime, those bait shows are going to hold a lot of red grouper. Definitely. Now you kind of got to hit and move. Uh, and what I mean by that is a big bait school is going to be moving. So it's hard to anchor up over a bait show because sure. by the time you set your anchor and do a few laps, that bait, uh, bait school is going to disperse. Right. So I love drifting over them because you can get set up quickly and you're mobile because there's only going to be a few big fish sitting on that bait show. Sure. So you got to be able to be a little bit mobile. This time of year, though, mm -hmm. in that early spring, uh, still when the water's a little chilly, mm -hmm. a lot of times those red groupers are held up in the bottom of that swiss cheese especially after a big blow or any kind of pressures on the area right so you can anchor up over an area of hard rock bottom and not even see a fish show sure but then you drop those squid wings down you drop those mm -hmm. live pinfish down and they start to kind of come up out of the bottom right so often uh, especially younger captains will anchor up in an area and if they're not chewing right away he's pulling anchor and getting ready to move yeah Red grouper are one of those things, man, you can wait them out and chum the water, and once you drop some baits down, they start to kind of come alive for you. Exactly. That You can you actually build the interest, so we talk about this, uh, be it Scott talk about this all the time, it, it's it's an interest level. Mm -hmm. You know, you may be marking fish, you may not be marking yep. fish, but if you're in the right habitat, you're in the right area, and especially in those Swiss cheese bottoms, maybe you're seeing that broken bottom read on your sonar, you see in that, uh, but you're not getting bit right away. Well, you know, keep feeding them. Keep putting yeah. bait in the water. Get the smell in the water. Yeah. Let them know that you're there. And, you know, if you're catching little undesirable fish like Tom Tates and grunts and stuff like that, pinfish or whatever, you know, those fish congregating upon your bait is getting the attention of everything else that lives down there. So give it a longer try. If you're on those areas like he's talking about, just you know, wait them out and keep putting stuff in the water. And that brings up a good point. You have those smaller species, those Tom Tates, those uh, gray snapper or white mm -hmm. grunts, uh, those other species that are going to come up there and nibble at your bait. If you're using a long strip of squid, uh, a lot of times what you can do is just lift that rod tip to the sky real slowly and drop it back down to bottom real slowly. And as those smaller species come up chasing that bait, that bigger grouper is going to be seeing that action and he's going to kind of come over to investigate. Exactly. And a lot of times, especially in the summertime when the water starts to get a little bit more warm, those red grouper will sit on top of your bait. So when you go to lift that bait from the surface, he's going to swallow it and start going. Yep. So a lot of times when you go to lift up away from those smaller species is when you're going to feel the weight of that big fish and you can start cranking them home. And uh, it's, I call it sitting on top of or mouth in your baits. Right. And uh, we're coming into the time of year when that's more and more prolific. Yeah. 
But enough about red grouper. Let's move into something a little bit more uh, exciting. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite species to target is mangrove snapper. Me too. I love big mangroves. They're not the biggest snapper species, but they can get pretty darn big. And, you know, on appropriate tackle, they're amazing fighters and they're delicious. Yes, they are. One of my favorite things uh, to target mangrove snapper with is a double snell rig. In my opinion, you can't go mangrove snapper fishing without a double snell rig. Mm -hmm. And a double snell rig is really simple. Uh, you're just snelling two hooks. Typically, you're using... Um, I personally like to use a hook like this uh, to where I have the bent back shanks where I can snell that line right along the shank of the hook and then you're going to put a second hook right in front of that one so you're able to put two hooks into your bait at once. Uh, and typically with a mangrove snapper species that's going to come up and nibble quickly, I personally like using these J hooks because I'm able to set the hook more quickly. Now, offshore, you have to use uh, circle hooks for reef species. So I have to supply circle hooks if you're fishing on our party boats or charter boats. But I personally like using J hooks for any snapper species that's going to come up mm -hmm. and quickly bite. Sure. And the way around that is by using uh, a pair of D hookers or something like this that's going to be able to get those uh, J hooks out of a fish more quickly. Right. And we'll go into those at the end of the segment and a little bit more about the tools of the trade that we use. Sure. But the double snell rig with the little sardine plug is the best way to target these mangrove snapper. What I mean by a sardine plug is typically I'm taking either a, a thread fin or a sardine, Spanish sardine, and the first step is cutting the tail off. You never want to have a tail on the bait. There's a few golden rules of uh, offshore fishing. Mm -hmm. One is making sure your bait doesn't spin. One is making sure that you hold bottom. And then the third one is when you get a bite, don't be a jerk real don't be a jerk yeah those are kind of your basics and uh when my kids seminars are like starting out there mm -hmm. but you guys are more advanced than that so we'll mm -hmm. skip over all that but first step again cutting that tail off the bait to start preparing your plug then i like cutting the head off the bait so that way i have uh open wounds on either side of the bait fish and then if i'm using a thread fin i trim the belly so now I have uh, an open belly cavity, and then I have my tail cut, my head cut, and I've got a perfect plug. And that's when I put those double snell rig into. Also, on longer trips, you want to brine your bait. So often I see people on a 12, 39, 44-hour trip, and they don't have a bait cooler. And you're really missing out if you're doing a longer trip and you don't have some kind of bait cooler to brine your bait. Mm -hmm. Because if you're brining that sardine, especially after you've prepared it into a plug, you're able to get some more rigidity to that bait. Definitely. And then it's hard on the outside. And when that mangrove snapper bites into it, it's like the old gusher fruit snack that you used to eat all the right. time as a kid. Right. When he bites into it, it just explodes with oils and it gets other snapper species excited. Absolutely. Those sardines, man, when they start getting chopped up down there, they put so much scent in the water. Yeah. And it really gets the fish fired up for sure. So a quick background on how to brine a bait. I typically bring a bait cooler that's... Uh, a six pack cooler I call it just big enough to fit a six pack of beer into and you start preparing your brine which would be cutting your plugs up once you've got your plugs cut up you put a nice little layer of plugs on the bottom of that cooler a thin layer of ice on top of them and then a nice coating of salt and then you repeat that process until your cooler is full so that's a great way to prepare that bait on the ride out, especially when you're on a party boat and you've got a six hour run out to the middle grounds. Uh, it allows that bait to sit there and kind of um, brine or get ready uh, for marinate, if you will. Uh, and then by the end of that trip, after 20 hours of fishing on a 39 hour trip, that brine is just nothing but brown sardine juice. Mm. And that bait comes out so hard and rigid. By the end of the trip, it's, it's like fish crack. They yeah, love that stuff. I do. And then also in that brine cooler, you can not only prepare your sardine plugs, but you can sneak a few grouper baits in there too by just trimming the tail off a bait and leaving a whole thread fin in there. Or same thing with the sardine, or maybe cutting the tail and cutting the head and not trimming the belly, leaving some more big baits in there. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of mix and match what you think you're gonna need through the trip, you can get ready in your brine cooler. And even if you're doing a 10, 12 hour trip with your buddies on his little boat, try using that cooler and see how your bait stacks up to your buddies on that same boat. And I guarantee on the next trip, everybody will have a cooler too. Just another one of my mangrove snapper secrets. The other secret 
is using the right kind of tackle. Again, two speed reels are number one, allowing you to have the speed uh, to target those mangroves, but also have being able to downshift if you get that big red grouper or gag grouper. This is my Daiwa Saltiga. I really like this guy when I'm fishing out there in the deeper waters for mangrove snapper uh, because I have more drag, uh, drag strength. Mm, drag capacity. <laughs> it, drag capacity, if you will. Uh, so that way, if I get one of those big grouper to bite, I can quickly downshift and still have a fighting chance. Definitely. The lever drag system takes a while to get used to, uh, especially if you're a guy like me that grew up on the back of a party boat or if you grew up deep sea fishing, mm -hmm. uh, everybody started with star drag. So kind of switching over to that lever drag system takes a little bit of work, but it's definitely worth the challenge definitely. because over time you'll fall in love with it. Uh, but I'm still waiting for that day they make a star drag two speed. It'll be a good day. That would be sweet. I want to see that too. Yep. Yeah, the the kind of reel you're using makes a big difference. You know, when you're catching fish that uh, you know don't weigh a whole lot, then yeah, you can reel them up faster. But just as Dylan said, if you're catching big, big grouper, AJ stuff like that, mm -hmm. stuff that pulls and digs hard, you need a tractor. You don't need a Corvette. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's basically what it what it boils down to. You need something with pulling power because there's only so much you're going to be able to lift with that rod, and that fish uh, is is so powerful that you've got to have the, the strong gears and you've got to have the right gears to be able to basically winch him in uh, when you need it. Yeah. Because there's going to be times, you know, when you've got that big group around the bottom, you've got your rod maxed out. The only thing left is that handle. And you got to put a couple turns on that mm -hmm. handle to get him out. And if you don't do it, that's it. Yep. And you got to be quick on the crank, getting that fish up off the bottom. And uh, my little secret is the grouper dance. You kind of move that rod in short, steady pumps, smooth as possible. And once you've got five to ten cranks on that fish, you got them beat. Yeah. Because once they lose sight of bottom, it's like they give up the fight. So once you get that big grouper up off the bottom and he starts losing sight of the bottom, it's kind of like they give up. Mm -hmm. But back to my mangrove snapper techniques one of the biggest approaches and recommendations i make to people are using thin wire hooks you can't use that 4x hook when you're targeting mangrove snapper the thinner barb the thinner wire hook uh, allows you to target mangrove snapper and set that hook home more quickly because the thicker the diameter of the wire of the hook the harder it is to set that hook home right. also the bigger the barb the harder it is for that barb to penetrate that mangrove snapper mouth. The wire, the smaller barb, all amounts to setting that hook in that mangrove snapper's mouth more quickly. Now you also have to find a balance because if you use tin, too thin of a wire hook, you're going to be breaking hooks on that nine pound mangrove. Sure. Whereas if you're using too thick of a wire, it's hard to set that hook. You're missing fish when you try to set that bite. Then, in my opinion, the barb size, you can go as thin as possible or even flatten your barb mm -hmm. because if you're reeling fast enough, especially with these two speed high gear ratio reels, as long as you keep on that mangrove snapper, he's not going to be able to spit that hook. But mangroves are very smart. They're going to be swimming up to the surface with their mouth open, trying to spit your hook. And if you slow down at all, he's going to be able to spit your hook. And they're smart fish. A mangrove's going to fight you until he loses sight of the bottom. Yeah. Now a gag, when he loses sight of the bottom, he gives up and it's just an easy crank to the surface most of the time. Right. A mangrove snapper, once he loses sight of bottom, he turns towards that boat and starts swimming up as fast as he can. Mm -hmm. And the reason he does that is he's trying to get slack in that line so he can spit your hook. So as long as you stay cranking hard on that fish and don't give him any slack, your barb size doesn't matter because he's not going to be able to spit that hook. But a quick recap, again, mangrove snapper fishing, double snell, imperative. High gear ratio reel, really important. Making sure you're hooking your double snell to present your bait naturally, and then being able to have the right size wire hook and the thin barb to be able to set that hook home more quickly in that mangrove snapper's mouth. Thanks for tuning in to the video. If you liked it, make sure you hit the subscribe button to follow Head First Fishing on their next adventure. And remember, if you're too busy to go fishing, you're just too busy.